Richard, can you uh, bring up my PowerPoint? Um, well, it's great to be here. This is a, a wonderful conference already, um, and uh, it, is a, it is kind of an historic day because this issue of uh, how Asians are treated in higher education has been, has been building for 25 years or so. It really took off, I think, as an issue in 2014 and has now become one of the major domestic issues in the United States. And those of you in this room have played an important part in bringing that about. So it's very exciting to be here. Uh, it's a great conference. M my only suggestion is that uh, to be perfect, this conference needs one thing, a timekeeper. Um, using my advanced quantitative skills, I have calculated that, that our speakers so far have exceeded their expected times by an average of 1.7. Uh, a factor 1.7. So I'm going to aspire to cover my material in about uh, 10 minutes. Um, and what I have to say is, is fairly simple. I want to make, I want to make sort of two, two or three general points. Uh, when I was a young undergraduate at Harvard in the 1970s, I had a, a, a freshman roommate who was Jewish and who told me that uh, that there was no question that uh, Jewish Americans had been discriminated against by Harvard in the 1920s and 1930s. And I was kind of amazed. I had never heard that before. Um, but by the time I, I finished Harvard, it was, you know, I had heard that story enough times that I was pretty sure it was true. And then in the early 1990s, uh, uh, published works started coming out showing that this was true. And essentially what happened is Harvard used to just have a test. Um, they didn't admit based on social class, remarkably. Uh, they had a very upper class, large upper class representation, but, but there was an exam. And you took the exam, and if you passed the exam, then you got in. And Harvard found by the mid-1920s that uh, the Jewish Americans, uh, who mostly had immigrated since 1890 or so, were heavily over, overrepresented by a factor of something like uh, six relative to their numbers in the American school age population. So Harvard decided to uh, clamp down on this, and their chosen method for doing so was to essentially get rid of the entrance examination and start admitting based on a variety of factors, including an all-important assessment of personal character. And uh, indeed, that, that produced a precipitate decline in Jewish American admissions, uh, which policy did not really change until, I think, the 1950s. Um, so, even those who have pointed this policy out have had trouble realizing that something almost identical is going on now, that since 1990 or so, um, Harvard has essentially re-ramped re up its attention to personal ratings, now not in an effort to control Jewish American admissions, but to control Asian American admissions and try to increase the representation of underrepresented minorities. Uh, as Edward has, has uh, explained with great clarity, a lot of that is driven by the use of personal ratings. So it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's almost uh, a self-parody how, how, how closely Harvard is following the script of, uh, that it followed in the 1920s. So this is uh, some of the key data that Edward was describing. These are the personal ratings by the top four academic deciles, which is where an awful lot of Harvard admittees come from. So the top four de deciles in terms of your rating by SAT scores and high school grades and other academic considerations. Um, and, and it's measuring, what's measured on this axis is the percent of students by race who get a personal rating of one or two. In other words, a very good personal rating. And what you can see is that for, in the top decile, uh, about 28% of whites get a high personal rating, about 22% of Asians, about 47% of African Americans, and about 34% of Hispanics. So these are the really large racial disparities that Edward was talking about. And if you go down the deciles, what's very striking is this, that this pattern remains identical in every decile. And there's a slight decline in ratings as people's academics go down their average personal ratings drop down a little bit, but the, the drop that's related to academics is very small compared to the big drops related to race. 
So if I showed you a chart with their academic ratings, you'd see sort of the reverse pattern. Uh, it, it'd be exactly reversed. Asians would be the highest, African Americans would be the lowest. So what this looks like is, is Harvard is simply using personal ratings to sort of counterbalance. And on top of that, they, they use some race-specific uh, preferences of various types. They have a variety of, of other uh, tricks in their bag. But this is a really key thing, and it, and it's, it is rightfully what's attracted a disproportionate amount of media attention. And you know what's frustrating is, well, how do you actually re rebut this? We can show that objectively Asian Americans are involved in more extracurricular activities, but, you know, but this is a subjective, not an objective measure. Well, happily, there's some data from UCLA that's, that's quite relevant. So after Prop 209 passed in California, and the UC schools adopted race-neutral undergraduate admissions starting in 1998, uh, several schools evolved systems that did similar things. And UCLA had a system from 2004 to 2006 that was uh, a pretty race-neutral system. There was probably a little bit of thumb on the scale behind the scenes, but it was fairly race-neutral. And they, they used three ratings for students. They had an academic rating, a personal achievement rating, and a life disadvantage rating. The life disadvantage was intended to take into account socioeconomic factors, uh, you know, and, and the quality school you went to and things like that. The uh, academic rating was similar to Harvard's academic rating. The personal achievement rating took into account a lot of the things that Harvard's personal, personal rating took into account. And here is data for UCLA's personal ratings that's it's not exactly four deciles, even though I've got that on the chart, but I tried to approximate the deciles as closely as I could. And uh, by the way, I've never shown this data before. I think this is the, this is a, the public unveiling of this analysis. Um, you see a radically different story. If you look at the top decile, the highest personal ratings are actually achieved by Asian Americans. Um, but more important than that is that all four groups are relatively close to each other. If you go, to, go down, Asian Americans are, you know, uh, second in the, or third in, in the other deciles, but they're pretty close to the overall average. All these personal ratings are very close to each other, and what's clearly driving the trend is not race, but your academic achievement. In other words, there's a high level of correlation between your personal rating and your academic achievement, which is not surprising. Anyone who works in higher education will tell you that, yeah, students who, who tend to excel academically also tend to be the ones who are most involved, who assume leadership possessions, you know, not, not in a mechanical absolute way, but very frequently that's the relationship that exists. So this is a, uh, a quantitative way of exploding the vicious myth that Harvard is perpetuating, that there's actually a, a racial difference in, in personal achievement. Mm -hmm. So this is a good place to applaud. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a story that we need to get out. Yes. Um, OK, so the other point I want to make is, um, you've seen that slide. I'm not going to, for the interest of time, I'm going to uh, not talk about some other aspects of the Harvard lawsuit that I could. P possibly in Q&A, I can get into some of it. But I want to tell you one other story, and that's about the University of California. So um, as I said, in 1996, uh, with Ward Connerly's leadership and an assist from Pete Wilson and, and various other people in California, California voters adopted Prop 209, I think by a 56-44 margin, uh, which prohibited the use of racial preferences in state programs. Uh, the UC schools responded by eliminating race formally in 1997 in their graduate programs and in their undergraduate programs in 1998. And I've done a lot of research on what happened. We, we got very good data from the University of California in the late 2000s that allowed us to examine uh, trends before and after the implementation of Prop 209. It was a nice natural experiment on what happens when you try to reduce the use of race. And the UC schools actually did something pretty interesting and, and I think pretty admirable. They invested a lot of money to try to maintain diversity, not by using preferences, but by building a pipeline. They invested to a degree they never had before in trying to create connections between UC schools and disadvantaged high schools across the state. 
They did all sorts of outreach programs so that high school students who were promising knew what were the courses that they needed to take in high school to qualify to even be considered by UC. They did all sorts of tutoring programs and uh, they, you know, they made people familiar and comfortable with the idea of going to a UC. And those things had really dramatic effects. Among other things, they seem to be associated with a really large increase in high school graduation rates for African Americans and Hispanics. So Yu Kong talked before about how we have to get at the, the real problem, educational inequality, differences in, in actual achievement at the K-12 level. And the UC experience is incredibly rich in showing us how, just how much that can happen when you sort of force the institutions to not focus on racial preferences, but actually focus on the substance of education. Well, part of what that did is it really did change the pipeline um, for, uh, for the UC schools. We had dramatic increases in applications. I mean, one of the ironic things here is that um, there was a lot of, in the Prop 209 debate, there was a, a widespread argument that passing a uh, race neutrality would have a chilling effect on the, uh, uh, the number of blacks and Hispanics who applied to the UC schools. The idea was that if we sort of said, well, uh, you know, we're no longer doing special preferences for blacks and Hispanics, then those students would say, well, I guess that school doesn't really want me, so I'm just going to go somewhere else. And what we found was the exact opposite. The schools that had had the largest racial preferences had the biggest increases in black and Hispanic applicants. It was like a 15% increase, just controlling for everything else at, at Berkeley by itself. So you could see in these numbers, this really large increase, improvement in the pipeline between 89 and 2006, um, really dramatic changes, and they've continued, they've continued beyond that. Um, oh, this is the, the change in the high school graduation rates, which, as I said, was, is really stunning over a relatively short period of time. And this is freshman enrollment. And what you could see is that by 2006, African-American numbers were higher than they had been in 1997 before the implementation of Prop 209. Hispanic numbers were like 75% higher, and numbers went up for other groups as well. You can see the total number also went up, partly because in a system that was treating people fairly and which people generally felt much more enthusiastic about, there was significant support for state funding. So this was a period where the UCs were thriving and expanding their enrollment. But then something happened. Um, all the while that these positive things were occurring, media stories kept coming out about the horrendous effects Prop 209 was having on minority enrollment, which were generally incredibly skewed stories. They were usually focused on a freshman enrollment just at Berkeley and UCLA, which, as the schools that had the largest preferences, did have some significant decline in, in black and Hispanic freshman enrollment. They had increases in black and Hispanic transfers and graduation rates. Graduation rates, like, doubled. Um, but if you, if you were determined to sort of paint the outcomes in a negative way, you could find little corners of the UC to, to do this. So this all fed into a drumbeat of effort to reintroduce quiet racial preferences. And that's essentially what started happening in 2007, first at UCLA, and then spreading to other campuses. There's an internal report, I'm not going to take the time to show you, but UCLA commissioned an internal report that I was able to get a copy of last year, done by Robert Mayer, distinguished sociologist, who documented that when you took into account everything the UCLA considers in admissions, there was this large unexplained racial residual that amounted to hundreds of denials for Asian American applicants each year and hundreds of acceptances of other groups. Uh, so I am currently in the process of, uh, of trying to force UC to disgorge information on its post-2007 practices. And we hope to get a resolution to that later this year. Um, if we find from that data that there is, in fact, discrimination, we want to take other action. So something you're going to hear about various important uh, initiatives today, but I think this is one of them, and I'm going to uh, reach out to you, and I hope you'll reach out to me to, um, to pursue this further. And, and I think we have a great opportunity to to really do something that's quite important in this battle, which is to establish that once the law says you have to be race neutral, the universities really have to be race neutral. And we have to have mechanisms to make them transparent enough so that we can enforce that neutrality. Thanks very much.
Well, essentially, 2007 is where uh, race preferences start coming back in. Um, and so you're seeing drops in both the Asian American and the white category, which I think essentially reflect that. To some extent, you know, we would expect to see some increase in Hispanic enrollment because the demographics of California have moved more towards Hispanic. We'd expect to see some increase in African American enrollment from the improvements in outreach and so on. But they shouldn't be this large. And the size of that is, is a reflection of the reintroduction of preferences. So that's part of what we're trying to document for the period 2007 on. But what's key is, is that for the period from 98 to 2006, you can see these very positive results. And what I haven't shown you is, is that, you know, uh, graduation rates go up dramatically for all groups, uh, especially for, for uh, these are the graduation rates for, for unrepresented, Amer uh, unrepresented minorities. You also see dramatic improvements in um, STEM graduation, STEM enrollment and STEM graduation. So this is, you know, a lot of my work that you're, you may be familiar with is on the mismatch issue. And we've gotten stunning confirmation of, of these mismatch effects. When you get rid of the racial preferences, then uh, black and Hispanic achievement just take off. 